candidate Ben Zion will be the first in our speaking order. Candidate Shaq, you will be the second in our speaking order. And candidate Taylor will be the third in our speaking order. To our audience observing this debate, thank you very much for joining us today on September 17th, 2019 for the fourth and final virtual debate among the United States Transhumanist Party candidates for the nomination for the office of the United States. We are joined today by candidates Yohanan Ben Zion, Jonathan Shatke, and Matt Taylor. I myself am Janati Solirov II, the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Unfortunately, while we were scheduled to have candidate Ruan joining us for this debate, he was called to uh, some emergency duties, and therefore he will not be able to attend this evening. We regret this. We benefited from his comments, his insights. Nonetheless, in this debate, we also expect to have some thoughtful impact on the kids. With that being said, the format of this debate is going to be the same as the third virtual debate, which you heard on Saturday, September 14th. We have 13 questions that have been crowdsourced from our members. And these questions are going to be asked to the presenter. Each candidate will have three minutes to address the first 12 questions and two minutes to address the 13th question. Candidates are not obligated to use all of their time. If they do not use all of their time on any given question, that time will then be deferred to subsequent speaking slots. And at the end, for concluding remarks, there will not be a specific time allotment. So candidates will have as much time as they had accumulated up to the debate. And then we would go through the rotation and essentially draw down on time until every candidate has either run out of time or decided to relinquish his time. Mr. So, Shatke, are you familiar with how to mute your microphone? Because there's a lot of interference. I believe. Sorry, Gennady. Yes, I, I did that. Yeah, headphones, not a bad idea with this many folks on the call. We are getting some feedback and some delayed audio. So I would encourage each candidate who is not speaking to mute their microphone until it is time for that candidate to speak. And now, without further ado, let us launch into our first question for this debate. This question comes from our member Thomas James O'Carroll. Mr. O'Carroll observes that as a candidate for office and as president of the United States, if elected, some of the outcomes you achieve will be based solely on the person that you are and the morals that you hold. Tell us about the person you believe yourself to be and why that strengthens the person who will be remembered by history during your presidency. Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor for three minutes. Well, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, 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 Thomas O'Carroll. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've had a chance to uh, share a lot of information and um, wonderful, wonderful conversations, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit. I'm Johan Ben Zion. I'm a career educator, a curriculum developer, and uh, also an entrepreneur. I have a biotech startup. Uh, uh, my partners are on, and I are working now on a microbial biosynthesis project uh, uh, therein. We just got that lab set up, um, uh, starting to do some really interesting work there. Uh, like a lot of people in my generation, I've worked in a lot of different fields, um, had to do some uh, different uh, kinds of work. Uh, but I've been in this world of organizing for quite a, a while. Um, many of you know me as a, the founder and chair of the Arizona Transhumanist Party and uh, a ranking officer in uh, some other similar organizations. Um, I believe I can bring an understanding of public policy, uh, particularly as it relates to technology, that is our area of focus. Uh, that they, these under, other candidates uh, don't always bring to the table. Many of them not really trying to seemingly try to bring that to the table. And maybe it's not such an easy thing to uh, sit down and write a platform uh, uh, with a great team that I worked with from the Arizona Transhumanist Party, uh, like the Futurist New Deal for America. Um, 
Uh, so a lot of people in this race, not speaking of anyone at, at this panel specifically, I haven't been able to uh, really do that. Uh, and um, some of those people uh, have had to rely on a lot of antics and and that alone, uh, it makes for an interesting, uh, interesting primary. But uh, that's really not what the job requires. Uh, to be the representative of this organization at the national level, uh, you have to understand these policies. Uh, you have to be a professional presenter. Um, and um, and you really have to be passionate about the emerging technology uh, that is the reason that we're all here. You have to have a coherent vision. And the Futurist New Deal for America is precisely that. Um, uh, all of us, we've been working over these many years uh, to set the stage for a longevity escape velocity. The Futurist New Deal for America was crafted uh, with a universal longevity escape velocity in mind. Um, at first glance, if you look at these e-governance reforms, and these economic reforms, um, you might need a little more information to connect the dots there, but we have to be able to uh, build a society uh, that can sustain um, uh, well, the well-being of our citizens in the right way. And uh, we have to do our due diligence there. Sadly, we haven't done that, particularly in recent decades. And um, uh, we are close enough now. We have the prototypes uh, for things uh, that would allow us to have longer lifespans. Uh, so what remains is a broad public consensus. Uh, we need to be reaching out to folks in every way that we can through policy clubs uh, like this one, through your own personal outreach and discussions and in promoting other businesses and initiatives. We can prepare a path and we must do it. Radical life extension is closer than you think. So get ready. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. I will say that you were right on time and therefore we will proceed to candidate Shapke. You have three minutes for the first debate question. Candidate Chatke, I believe you are muted. I am Jonathan Chatke, and I have uh, tried to live my life as a man of honor. Uh, I've done everything I can to be honorable in my business uh, and in my uh, personal life. Um, I believe a man of honor is uh, the most important part of uh, being president. Um, you are going to see situations as, as president where you are not going to have a chance to get all the information. You are going to have to honor your, your vows uh, to the Constitution and to the people of the United States. And uh, I think that that's the most important part of the job. Um, in order to free your immortality, uh, I want to uh, return the Constitution to prominence in governance. And uh, I think that that's the best way to handle it according to the uh, vow that I would take as president. That's all. Thank you, Candidate Shatke. Uh, you, you have uh, one minute, eight, eight seconds accumulated that will carry over to your future time segments. Next, we will have Candidate Matt Taylor give his question in three minutes. Candidate Taylor, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Gennady for moderating this debate and to Steele uh, for providing us with the platform uh, to express our views. I strive to follow a personal code of ethics uh, based on the writings of G. Joseph Jock uh, that defines uh, and informs all of my actions and decisions. Number one. I will develop my life for the greater good. This is why I'm here. This is my way to reach uh, the most people to promote transhumanist ideals, which are to the benefit of all of America and all of the world. Number two, I will place character above riches and concern for others above personal wealth. My decisions are based on what is right, not what will line my pockets. Number three, I will b never boast, but cherish humility instead. Our current president likes to lie about his accomplishments, but I will be a humble public servant. Number four, I will speak the truth at all times and forever keep my word. 
we need to be able to trust our president, who is the mouthpiece of our government. Number five, I will defend those who cannot defend themselves. This tenet directly informs my platform. Number six, I will honor and respect all people and refute sexism, racism, and intolerance in all its guises. I will govern all Americans with fairness and equality. Number seven, I will uphold justice by being fair to all. Number eight, I will be faithful in love and loyal in friendship. Nine, I will abhor scandals and gossip, neither partake nor delight in them. Ten, I will be generous to the poor and those who need help. I hold that to be true in my personal as well as my public life. Eleven, I will forgive when asked that my own mistakes will be forgiven. I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong uh, and to change my mind when new information comes to light. And twelve, I will live my life with courtesy and honor from this day forward. That's my personal code of honor, code of ethics. Uh, that is my way of life and it will inform all of my decisions as president of the United States. Thank you, candidate Taylor. You spoke for two minutes and 25 seconds, so you have 35 seconds over to your future time segments. And thank you to all candidates for your responses to the first question, a highly important question, on moral character. Now we proceed to our second question from Denora Delphine, the Director of Admissions and Public Relations for the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Ms. Delphine asks, what do you think people want in a good leader? Which may not necessarily be what you think makes a good leader. So focus on what you consider the public to desire in terms of the attributes of a good leader. Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor for three minutes. Yes. Uh, well, I believe that our, our civil society has a blind spot right now about uh, this uh, uh, number one value of the transhumanist party, which is a life extension. And uh, so uh, this is an interesting question, and I thank Denora uh, for posing it. Um, uh, a life extension and related public health outcomes is the most important goal to uh, people like us. And uh, f finding the best way to make that happen, it's, uh, I believe, the primary leadership quality uh, that people are looking for in this organization. Um, I don't know that I would have the precise same association with the Transhumanist Party if uh, radical life extension were not uh, placed as highly in our charter document uh, and organizing principles as it is. Um, I, this is something that is very, very important to me personally and uh, professionally. And um, um, there, have been, we, there have been people in the course of this primary uh, who've tried to downplay uh, the, the role uh, of life extension. And um, I, I think this is a mistake. I think that um, uh, whether the people of this country realize it today or not, uh, that we must uh, uh, carry the standard uh, for this important uh, set of public health goals. And um, um, if, you are, if you are someone who has been trying to deflect from that, if your answer in discussing these uh, uh, core values of our organization generally is yes, but, um, and then um, uh, some obfuscation, uh, changing the subject, flipping the script, eh, maybe stop doing that. Uh, that's not why we're here. Uh, this is a policy club uh, that is intended to advance a uh, life extension and techno futurist outcomes. Uh, those discussions are, are of, uh, of, of great importance uh, to us, and uh, we want to be having positive discussions on the, along those lines and uh, advancing uh, this agenda in the public square. Um, and um, um, if the subject is broached and, um, and uh, super longevity is brought up, initiatives to improve these outcomes is brought up, uh, consider not listing reasons why we shouldn't be doing this or why we shouldn't be talking, why we should be talking about another uh, subject, uh, but rather uh, support candidates who are transhumanist through and through. Uh, in the immortal words of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Um, uh, and shifting the focus, uh, the many trillions of dollars uh, that we now spend effectively on end of life care, emergency services, 
uh, to preventative measures, longevity-oriented healthcare. It's it's no easy feat, uh, but it is what we will do in the coming years, and uh, we will save millions of lives and make our public health systems and networks run more efficiently in doing so. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Candidate Benzayan. You were, again, right on time in your response. We now proceed to Candidate Shaq. Shaki, what do you think people want in a good leader? I believe people uh, wish a leader to lead, uh, to describe a vision for the country that uh, they can get behind. And I think the vision of the Transhumanist Party is a strong vision. I think the, uh, the vision of uh, growth in through technology in uh, science, uh, growth through technology in healthcare, and um, bringing the benefits of of that technology to all of the country. I think that's a that's a message that the, the country would get behind and, and would be very uh, happy to uh, follow along with and. They the, they don't expect a leader to direct their every step, but to give to guide them in what will give them a place in the in the 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 goal, and that is is what a leader uh, and as president I think that's exactly what we need we, we need to do. So I think that's uh, you know what people are looking for. Thank you, Candidate Shaki. We will carry 100 seconds over to your future speaking slots. Next, we have Candidate Matt Taylor. Candidate Taylor, in three minutes, what do you think people want in a good leader? Well, with respect to uh, Ms. Delphine, I can only know for sure what qualities I'd like to see in a leader. Uh, I think to speculate otherwise is a dangerous road. So allow me to explain what a good leader is to me. A good leader inspires. A good leader has a bold vision and pursues it with tenacity. A good leader listens and gathers information, all the information they can, uh, to make the best decision. A good leader leads by example. They are not afraid to take on the burden uh, the hard work necessary to pursue their vision and transform it into reality. A good leader surrounds themselves with the best people so that they can efficiently gather information to solve problems and effectively delegate authority. I can be that leader for the Transhumanist Party and for America. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Taylor. We will carry 130 seconds over to your future speaking times. Thank you to all the candidates for your responses to the second question. Now, for the third question, we move to uh, an inquiry from our member Tanvir Ahmed, who asks, what can you do to keep us alive forever? And I like to characterize this as the transhumanist variant of the question, what's in it for me? So, candidate. Ben Zion, what can you do to keep us alive forever? Yes, that is a question um, uh, that uh, that keeps me up at night. And um, no, it, in, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, it's uh, it's the thing that I think about the most. Um, how can we do this for the people of the United States? Uh, how can we set the stage for a universal longevity scale velocity as soon as humanly possible? As I mentioned a few moments ago. The difference between uh, between dallying on this could be the difference between many millions of lives lost, and that is a tragic uh, prop, uh, prospect. Uh, so we want to do that as soon as humanly possible. And the futurist New Deal was for America uh, was crafted uh, to better to better bring about these ends. Uh, so, so Mr. Ahmed, um, I would say you're a young man, so you're fortunate. You've been uh, born at uh, a lucky time in history. You're doubly fortunate there. Uh, so I would say uh, you should take care of yourself and your chances for remaining preternaturally young and healthy, even beyond the next uh, uh, five or six decades, uh, might be quite good. Uh, but uh, none of us has a crystal ball on this point. Uh, but as we know, um, uh, we are having uh, uh, demonstrated effects 
of reversing cell death and, and, similar, and similar things. Uh, Ray Kurzweil says that as of 2020, he believes that he has reversed his own cell death. So next year uh, and, move, and beyond, uh, Ray Kurzweil will be getting younger with every passing year rather than older. Um, and uh, that is an exciting prospect if true. Even if there's a kernel of truth to that, it has tremendous public health implications. And there are many ways that we can uh, be uh, better, uh, uh, better improving outcomes in, in the public and private sector, uh, some of which uh, uh, we, we will be discussing in the course of, of this debate. You know, I just saw a Wall Street Journal article that came out quite recently, um, uh, says that Israel prepares to unleash AI on, on healthcare. I shared it with quite a number of people. And uh, this is the kind of initiative that I've talked to a great many scientists, a great many medical men and women, a great many AI experts in the course of uh, hosting the Futures New Deal podcast and other events. And um, I feel uh, more confident than ever that we are moving in the right direction uh, to be using automation and AI digitalization uh, to uh, create a civilization where we can have uh, prevention, as I mentioned in the previous question, uh, at the center of uh, what we are doing as a society. And um, I happen to think that uh, many more public initiatives would help with this, uh, but many private initiatives will help with this as well. I agree with many of Do uh, John Schatke's uh, uh, points on a lot of these things. Um, my feeling is that we must do the thing that works, that saves those lives. And uh, that is always an open question. Um, no, none of us does have that crystal ball. Um, but it is very important that all of you have the courage of your convictions uh, to speak to people about these prototypes, about these life extension technologies, uh, all of the biomedical breakthroughs that might affect you, that might affect uh, your loved ones, that might affect those around you. Speak of it in a positive light. Talk about these prototypes as they, are, as they exist in reality, not far future considerations. Um, and tell people what's happening now with life extension, what it means for them what it means for all of us as a civilization. If we're unwilling to do this as a society, we run the very real risk of slowing the pace of biomedical breakthroughs, uh, irrespective of the focus of private or public monies. Uh, it, it, the onus is on us, and we must avoid shifting focus away from this in research and particularly in public discourse. As we said, there is, um, uh, uh, there is uh, a lot being done in research, not nearly enough being done in terms of public consensus. Um, I'll bank the remainder of my time. Thank you, Gennady. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. You have spoken for three minutes and 58 seconds. 58 seconds oh, I've lost your time. Future speaking <laughs> slot. You will I'll have the it. opportunity to make up some of that time later on if you so choose. But for now, we will move to Candidate Shackey. Candidate Shackey, what can you do to keep us alive forever? There's uh, a lot of things that the government would specifically uh, destroy the ability of doctors to keep you alive. Um, so I would work immediately to remove those impediments to your health care. Um, I would privatize the FDA and make it an advisory body and allow whatever you want to put into your body to be your decision. And, you, and with your doctor's uh, consultation and proper uh, con uh, con examination of the science uh, that is available to you, I think you can do a lot better job than a bureaucrat in caring for yourself. The second thing to do is to remove government funding from health care. And the reason for this is because government funding is rent seeking. A government funded research project does as little as they possibly can to continue the government funding. They do not ever want to find the actual solution, and that is antithetical to actually getting research and development done. I believe that the profit motive is the way to incentivize companies 
in order to get uh, new th research and development done. And that is not going to happen under grant situations from a government. It's just the incentive structure is exactly backwards for what you get. The, um, the third thing is, of course, to expand free government care in a way that doesn't um, clog the system of people who are seeking uh, private care and doesn't um, inflate the prices of private care unnecessarily. So I would remove all of Social Security recipients and Medicare and Medicaid from the private sector and have them be served by the VA. And that way, uh, while we would have to expand the VA in order to care for all those people, it would remove another barrier to getting quality health care at a good price. And I think I, that's my policy on this. Thank you, candidate Shadke. You spoke for the allotted three minutes. So now we proceed to candidate Matt Taylor. Candidate Taylor, what can you do to keep us alive forever? Once uh, immortality was the domain of the uh, the alchemists, uh, but today life extension has become a pursuit of mainstream science and medicine. This is the most exciting, most hopeful time in history to be alive. The first immortal has probably already been born. Radical life ex extension, even to the point of immortality, is the major goal of, trans of the transhumanist movement. But before we can reach that goal, we need to extend human life in smaller increments. My plan is to invest in medical research, to streamline the FDA approval process to promote innovation in medicine and medical technology, to change the medical patent process to bring life-saving and life-extending medicines and technologies more quickly and more affordably to the public. Public research through the NIH is also necessary uh, because we need to ensure that life extension does not only help the super rich. You and I and everyone need and deserve to live the longest, highest quality life possible. Furthermore, uh, life extension is worthless without tackling the greatest existential threat to humanity global climate change. Unless we bring together the greatest minds to solve this problem, and unless we rein in the industries pouring tons of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, and unless we move to renewable energy and nuclear energy, huge regions of our planet are going to become uninhabitable, driving refugees out of these areas. Uh, and until we solve this problem, all of the life extension and anti-aging technology will be worthless. But I think that we can solve this, and I think that we will solve this with the right direction and the right leadership. And furthermore, I, I think that then we'll be able to focus on anti-aging, which I think is the real answer to life extension, because it's all about not just adding adding years on to the end of the life of a person's life, but we have to improve the quality of their life throughout. And adding those years on into the middle or the earlier part of their life are going to make them more enjoyable and higher quality. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add, <coughs> we will add 18 seconds to your future speaking times. Next, we proceed to our fourth question from Pavel Illin, who is the secretary of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. And Mr. Illin asks, how will you mediate between different groups of interest within transhumanism? How will you have a dialogue between people of different interests, aesthetics, and ethical philosophies? How will you overcome othering and tribalism 
within transhumanism. So this particular question focuses on dynamics within the transhumanist movement itself. Candidate Ben Zion, you have three minutes. Yes, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question and an important question. Um, and uh, uh, one that has been at, in, at the center of my thinking and at the center of the thinking of, of the architects of the Futurist New Deal uh, from the first. Um, as someone remarked in the pre-show, our, uh, our, our esteemed uh, uh, friend and moderator, uh, Steele Archer, I believe, remarked, um, um, I am some, somewhat running to the right of myself on certain of these points, particularly as it relates to the reforms in the tax code. And, um, uh, but that is um, because I feel that it is important to appeal to all of these uh, different groups of, of diversity of political opinions across uh, the political compass. And um, and also because I think that the the um, the uh, life saving qualities in uh, these reforms, uh, particularly in the federal land dividend originated by Zoltan Istvin, um, at, that carried on in the futurist uh, New Deal for America in the form of a basic income uh, for all adults, all, all adult citizens in this country, um, is 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 something that we need to do immediately in the near term. It will be the first initiative uh, that we will be working on um, on January 21st, uh, 2021, those first 90 days of the Ben Zion presidency. And, um, and uh, th that is how important uh, this is. Uh, taking care of our middle class, reviving uh, this country, uh, turning things back into, onto the right path. Uh, that is more important uh, than spending many years bickering uh, with the Charles Kochs and the powers that be as to what their marginal tax rate uh, should or should not be. Um, I was moved uh, by what uh, candidate Taylor said uh, moments ago about climate change. In this, in this context, I'm also reminded of my recent discussions that I've had uh, with Ira Pastor uh, and with a fellow candidate and friend, uh, John Carricks. Uh, we, he and I spoke last night. Some of you have seen uh, that discussion. Uh, these are people who are both working on market solutions and working very hard uh, to solve the serious problems of our time, uh, namely public health and life extension and the climate crisis, respectively, of those two. Um, and um, um, uh, even though I have uh, focused on certain kind of private sector, uh, public sector initiatives, um, I don't want to undervalue the good work that people are doing in the private sector. Uh, these, are, these are real operators that we know in this organization. Um, it's easy to stand at the, uh, um, the sidelines and be an armchair philosopher. Uh, my advice to those people is, if you are a free market advocate, build something and fix these problems um, instead of uh, going on and on about these things. Um, and um, uh, the Futurist New Deal's uh, regulatory frameworks and other initiatives to deal with these problems, um, uh, I of this I would say, again, I do not have this rigid political philosophy. I am in favor of what works, and uh, we have to be remain agile in that. And I believe the Futurist New Deal for America is is the best option uh, of moving forward. Thank you, candidate Ben. Again, we will subtract twelve seconds from your future speaking times. Next, we proceed to candidate Shaki with regard to the fourth question: How will you mediate? between different groups of interest within transhumanism? How will you help overcome tribalism and othering and spark dialogue among individuals of different convictions? Well, when you have a, a number of different uh, subgroups in a, in a group, you uh, begin by listening to what everybody is, is interested in. Uh, and then, um, unless that is something that is in clear conflict with the ideals of the group, then you give them a purpose inside your group in order to contribute to the greater of the group's uh, mission. In this case, if I was to become president, I would take the cryonics people and help them to build up uh, a program of cryonics for uh, end of life preservation of every American, if they uh, if if they think they could do that. If uh, in terms of the life extension people, I would talk to them about uh, forming a life extension working group within the party, and then you have the you can give each of these people 
people input and strengthen their own position and yet um, by combining their efforts we end up with a greater whole than any of those groups would have come up with acting a, a, alone. Um, so we have AI people in the party and they will have strengths and they might not care about uh, you know cryonics but I don't see why they should be uh, hostile to the cryonics people. There's a lot of different issues to work out. So you allow each person to contribute in their uh, position of strength and you don't look for them to necessarily contribute in every position of the and I think that's the best way to work on building a large umbrella that can cover everyone and their needs and, and uh, desires in transhumanist uh, endeavors. Thank you, candidate Shadke. We will carry 41 seconds over to your future speaking slots. Next, we have candidate Taylor. How will you mediate between different groups of interest within transhumanism? Have a dialogue among people of different philosophies, interests, and aesthetics, and help overcome othering and tribalism. I'm disappointed that there is any othering going on within the transhumanist movement. After all, I think we're all here for the same reasons, to promote the ideals of transhumanism, to pursue the advancement of humanity through technology, through medicine, through science. But it's human nature to align yourself with like-minded individuals and to believe that your own reasoning is superior to others. At its core, the U.S. Transhumanist Party is a democratic organization and its membership will decide uh, the direction it will take and what values it will promote. But it's, all, it's important that we bring together representative stakeholders uh, of the various factions within transhumanism uh, in an open dialogue to work through those differences of opinion and to continue to redirect our energy towards the promotion of transhumanism rather than infighting. We believe, uh, we, I think we agree on what the puzzle will look like when it's been assembled. We're just disagreeing on whether to start in the middle where we recognize that picture or to start on the edge where we can find the border. And I think our similarities should unite us more than our differences divide us. With the right leadership, we can and will overcome our differences. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will carry 87 seconds over to your future speaking slots. Thank you to all the candidates for your responses to our fourth question. And now we proceed to our fifth question, also from Secretary Pavel Illin, who asks, how will you communicate with the non-transhumanist population and persuade people to become transhumanists and work with a lower future shock level audience? How will you overcome othering and tribalism within the broader society? So while the previous question focused on the transhumanist movement itself, this question focuses on the broader society. Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor for three minutes. Yes, well, that is a critical question, is it not? Um, outreach. And um, I, will, I will say again that the main, at the, ris at the risk of uh, repeating myself, the main aim in, in the crafting of the Futurist New Deal and in the crafting of the uh, charter documents of the, the United States Transhumanist Party and other affiliated and similar organizations. Um, we've worked um, uh, very hard in, 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 setting, in setting these up. And uh, the idea is that we must be able to do that outreach and we must prepare people for uh, these technologies which can sustain a universal longevity escape velocity. Um, and yet there are quite some number of people out there, uh, casual observers, uh, people who are not reading a lot of um, uh, emerging biomedicine uh, uh, news on a daily basis, uh, who, who might not be aware of this, 
and who might find the idea of a preternaturally long lifespan quite discomforting. Um, and um, I believe that we can um, uh, be very hopeful that these people will soon be turned uh, to our side. I do believe that. Um, uh, I believe that as we are able to provide these services to them, just as a matter of course, uh, through, through the existing public health channels, uh, that those concerns will quickly uh, fall away, uh, that that, um, that future shock uh, will quickly abate. Um, I, I, quite recently, I, I read and, and shared this wonderful article that I mentioned about digitalization and personalized medicine in Israel. Uh, people are beginning to make use of their public health system to do the kinds of things uh, that we've been talking about on the Futures New Deal podcast on a daily basis. And it's the thing that uh, uh, makes me want to be doing uh, this work on behalf of the USTP. It's the thing that makes me want to be doing this uh, work as, a, as an interviewer. And um, uh, we can do this good work for life extension. The proof of concept uh, concerns that many of these uh, people have or other concerns that might derive from some uh, knee-jerk reactions or provincial thinking. They will soon be replaced uh, by optimism and healthy self-interest. Um, as, as I've said many, many times in these interviews, uh, there is uh, something that we could describe as a de facto life extensionist, and that is overwhelmingly the U.S. citizenry. And all we have to do is plant the seed of these ideas in their mind and make these things available to them. As, uh, as uh, so many of people are saying that we will soon be able to do, and uh, our good work will be done. I'll, I'll bank the rest of my time. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion, for your future speaking slots. So that offsets uh, some of your previous remarks. And next we proceed to candidate Chad Key. You have three minutes. How will you communicate with the non-transhumanist population, work with a lower future shock level audience, and help overcome othering and tribalism within the broader society? Yeah, I think uh, I think most people uh, just don't realize how much of a transhumanist they are. Um, when you, you when a person uses a cell phone, they are nascent. Uh, sci cybernetically enhancing their their intellect when a person uses uh, a hip replacement they are a nascent uh, cyborg when somebody gets you know all these things that are, are just natural course of action for people these days are nascent transhumanism when somebody talks to a computer voice or pre-screening of a, of a call to their bank. They are uh, uh, participating with AI. All of these things, uh, they just don't realize that they're a transhumanist, <laughs> that they're, the, the, when the business puts that and they are thinking, I'm just going to do something to save a little cash, you know, that they are hiring an AI in order to do their job. AI is crude. It is still uh, that first step of AI sentience being part of their business and part of their part of their employees. So um, I think it's just explaining to them how what they are already doing and what they want in their life. And nobody wants to die uh, if they're healthy, right? Nobody says, uh, "What the hell?" Well, no, it's who are in pain, either mental pain or physical pain, who decide now is my time to end. Those people are, would have a new life. For a life extension, they just don't know. So, I think it's merely a case of showing where the natural desires of everybody are expressed under the Transhumanist Party banner. And I think that yield out of my time. Thank you, candidate Shatke. We will add 
23 seconds to your future speaking. Next, we proceed to candidate Taylor. You have three minutes to discuss how you will communicate with the non-transhumanist population, work with a lower future shock level audience, and help overcome othering and tribalism within the broader society. That division uh, between the left and the right, between the rich and the poor, between the old and the young, between urban and rural communities, that's the greatest problem in American society today. It's led to gridlock and stagnation, and we've even seen outright violence because of that division. However, on some level, all Americans want the outcomes that transhumanism promises. We all want to live longer, healthier, more enjoyable lives. We all want technological advancements to help humanity. We all want a world free of need. On some level, we are all transhumanists. I came to transhumanism because I was drawn to it, because it spoke directly to my beliefs about, um, about life extension, about health, um, directly with my beliefs about the use of technology and the pursuit of science. And I think that we can communicate this with the, um, with the non-transhumanist uh, community out there. Transhumanism can be the vehicle uh, to achieve um, the ends that I spoke of, um, longer lives, uh, world free of need, technolog technological advancements that will help all of us. And so transhumanism can become the scaffolding upon which we rebuild that American cooperative spirit. Transhumanism can be the stitching that um, that mends the torn fabric of American society. It's just a matter of spreading the word about transhumanism in a positive light and showing the way to the future that we all desire. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add 45 seconds to your future speaking slots. Now, a lot of our audience members observed some audio interference when candidate Shaki was speaking. So I'm going to give candidate Shaki the opportunity to restate at least the salient points of his answer so that we make sure we have it on record. Oh, terribly sorry about that. Um, basically, I believe that uh, most of the things that transhumanism wants to accomplish uh, are things that the vast majority of the people and businesses want to accomplish also. Uh, AI, uh, additional uh, life uh, of, of healthy uh, and, and long life. Um, th these are all things that everybody wants. Whether, whether the, the, so um, I think that that's the, 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 the way to do it is just to explain how what transhumanism is about is what they're about. Thank you, candidate Chatke. We heard you much more clearly this time, so we appreciate having those remarks available to our viewers. And that concludes the fifth question. We proceed to the sixth question, also from Secretary Pavel Illin, this time focusing on the healthcare system. He asks, how will you reform the healthcare system within the United States in order to ensure and accelerate the arrival of life extension therapies and the accessibility of those therapies. Candidate Benzion, you have the floor for three minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is a wonderful question from Pavel. And I would also encourage folks uh, to go back uh, to last week's podcast. I interviewed Pavel Illin, and he had a lot of interesting things to say on healthcare and also on a basic income. Uh, um, he had some, even some kind words to say about the federal land dividend. Uh, this is something that we must do, um, and there are manifold approaches um, and many kinds of initiatives that we can be 
uh, uh, setting forward to do so. Um, I've mentioned uh, some of these uh, kinds of initiatives in, er in the earlier parts of this discussion, uh, incorporating personalized medicine, using digitalization and automation uh, to shift those many trillion dollars in this United States uh, from effectively triage and end of life care to prevention, constant oversight, uh, doing the good work uh, that would allow us uh, to treat aging as a disease. And um, as uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We can put those many trillions of dollars of funds to far better. Um, it's very fine to hear other candidates talk about freedom in the abstract, uh, but the best sort of freedom that we can hope for as transhumanists is the freedom to live well, to live long, and to prosper. And for that, we must be willing to do more than pay empty lip service. We must be willing to take a stand, to build these new policy initiatives, to support these private undertakings and research, and to do the things that might tend to run counter um, uh, to uh, what is more mainstream. Uh, but, what it, but we must do it because it is right. And uh, in doing so, we will also be able to streamline, and lower the costs of medication as they come to market. Um, we will be able to, uh, we must also do uh, something that John Schatke mentioned, but I don't think we can go quite that far, but we must allow for a more robust right to try and um, allow our people to make use of life extension medications as they become available, also lowering the cost of medications and the time and streamlining those processes. Thank you, Steele, for addressing this technical issue once again. My name is Janati Stolirov II, Chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. We are here in the middle of quite an interesting debate, the fourth virtual debate among the U.S. Transhumanist Party presidential candidates. We are currently discussing question six from U.S. Transhumanist Party Secretary Pavel Illin, who asks, how will you reform the health care system within the United States in order to ensure and accelerate the arrival of life extension accessibility of these therapies. Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor for three minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is something that we must do. It is, as I've mentioned, the uh, first pillar of the United States Transhumanist Party, life extension. It is uh, the most talked about issue in all of these organizing documents and uh, within our organization. And uh, there are many kinds of initiatives uh, that we can be doing. I mentioned uh, this wonderful article um, uh, talking about Israelis uh, incorporating personalized medicine and digitalization into their public health service, and uh, the ways that we, the ways the idea that aging is a disease, um, if we have a public consensus on this point, and we begin to uh, legislate and organize our civil society in other ways around this idea, uh, we can save ourselves a lot of pain, so to speak, um, and. Um, uh, so we, we can be focusing on this prevention. We can be focusing on this constant oversight of citizens. We can be focusing on these life extension interventions that will shift this money. Uh, we spend many trillions of dollars in this country, uh, as I mentioned, what, on what is effectively end of life care. And um, we don't, of course, want to uh, harm people who are in that system today. We don't begrudge them those services, but we can be doing a lot better. Um, we can prevent them from ever being an extremist. Uh, we can do that by uh, building out a public health service that has uh, the digitalization and personalized medicine and uh, longevity at its center. Uh, and in doing so, we can allow them uh, to benefit from these preventative measures. I, as uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, this is what we can do in the public health uh, service. And in doing so, uh, we will uh, be, uh, we can be at the cutting edge of public health in this 21st century. Um, I mentioned um, uh, before a few other podcasts uh, that I've done with people on this subject, people who are very uh, devoted to this subject. I think of, uh, I think of uh, Paul Spiegel, um, who has a, a keen legal mind and a very deep understanding of, of the medical world and is working very hard uh, to um, uh, see that uh, these kind of things become a reality. Um, my running mate and I have had dealings with high level officials in Estonia um, um, to discuss uh, these kind of digitalization efforts. Of course, we know from our other talks that, um, that uh, Estonia is effectively a world leader in e-governance 
And they are the only country that has a fully fledged I voting system, a blockchain voting system uh, like the one uh, promised in the futurist New Deal for America. And because they have done this due diligence, because they, they have done this basic work of uh, building a public health service, of, uh, per, of uh, beginning to use digitalization in many ways through various e-services uh, more robustly in their civil society. Now they are also on the cusp of doing uh, what the Israelis are, um, are purported to be doing, uh, building a, a longevity public health service that focuses on prevention. And that costs in, in time, I believe in very short time, pennies on the dollar uh, to operate. And that is, uh, that is the, uh, also a, a point that should, uh, should not go unheeded. Um, it's very fine to hear other candidates talking about freedom in the abstract. Uh, but the best sort of freedom that we can all hope for is the freedom to live well, uh, to live long, and to prosper. And to achieve that, we must be willing to take a stand, uh, to build new public policy initiatives, uh, to support uh, private sector programs and research, and to do things that um, uh, we know we must do as life extensionists. Um, and some of those things in, involve privatization. We do need, and, and, and similar, it, it really depends on the situation. I don't believe that I agree with uh, candidate Shatke in, in privatizing uh, all of these all of these bodies, uh, but we do need a, a full and robust right to try. Uh, this have many good things that will derive from this: uh, streamlining, uh, shortening uh, the the pipeline for uh, medicines coming to market, lowering the cost of those medications. Uh, this is something that allows people in our community to make use of new life extension medications as soon as they become available. All of these things we must do uh, to build a society that will sustain a universal longevity escape velocity. Thank you. I'll bank the remainder of my time. Thank you, candidate Ben Zaya. So you spoke for uh, four minutes and 40 uh, seconds. We will add, we will subtract 100 seconds from your future speaking slots. And next we proceed to candidate Shatke. Candidate Shaki, how will you reform the health well, care system with the many of United the things States? that we know yes. right now? Many, many of the things that we know right now that can uh, achieve uh, additional healthy life are blocked in America because of FDA rules, uh, stem cell therapies, uh, medicines uh, that have been demonstrated and used are being used out in other countries are blocked by the FDA. So the first and foremost thing we need to do is remove the FDA from the issue so that people can get the therapies that they decide are best for their life extension. Um, the, accessi uh, that the, the accessibility and the cost of healthcare in America is uh, caused by two things. One, automatic government markdowns in, uh, in pricing, uh, where uh, Medicare sometimes requires as much as an 85% just markdown. And so, uh, obviously, they have to charge six times as much in order to get what they really need to uh, from Medicare. Um, and uh, the AMA has set up a uh, cartelization of the medical uh, profession in order to do a monopoly position and we need to break that monopoly position. So I, I propose a um, non-government entity uh, set up by the US government that would independently license additional doctors and those doctors would at the very least be able to practice in VA hospitals, in the military, and um, on uh, places that took Medicare patients, Medicaid, so that uh, those, those licenses would still be very valuable and useful. And that would increase the competition in the medical industry, which would uh, bring uh, medical care to more people at a better price throughout the, the country. So that's uh, the two-prong approach. We get rid of the government uh, messing with the market, and then we get rid of 
the monopolistic AMA uh, uh, stranglehold on doctors. And uh, so that I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, candidate Chapke. You will have 19 seconds carried over to your future speaking times. And now we proceed to candidate Matt Taylor. How will you reform the healthcare system within the United States in order to ensure and accelerate the arrival of life extension therapies and the availability of those therapies? Well, thank you, Chairman and uh, Steele for your quick action there uh, to get us back online. Because uh, it's important that we get these uh, the message out to the public, and this is right now our best forum. Uh, hopefully, we'll expand in the future. My goal is to work with legislators to provide a wider access to life-saving and life-extending medicine, including by providing a public Medicare option. No family should lose a loved one because they can't afford treatment. Nobody should be denied the best of care because their insurance company wants to save money. No one should go into debt or be forced to declare bankruptcy because of the high cost of medical treatment. When I needed surgery and, uh, and radiation treatment, my wife spent hours on the phone arguing with the insurance company that my treatment should be covered. And we sent many letters appealing the insurance company's decision to deny certain parts of my care because my doctors, who were the best we could find in the region and among the best in the nation, they were out of state. And so therefore they cost the insurance company a little more money. Uh, in the time when I needed her most, my wife, when she was already stressed to the max, uh, because of my cancer, she had to argue with a company that only wanted to save money, that didn't care about the quality of my treatment. That shouldn't happen. Now, I was fortunate uh, that we were able to use our savings to pay the difference in what they wouldn't cover, but others are not so fortunate. Uh, public option would prevent this and drive down healthcare costs uh, overall and life extension and anti-aging need to be part of that coverage as well as mental health services. We need to prevent illness as much as treat it so that all Americans can live long, healthy lives. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add 50 seconds to your future speaking times. And now we will proceed to question number seven of our virtual debate. Question seven is from our member Mike DiVerde, and Mr. DiVerde asks, would you support increases in funding for the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, to be used for basic research into transhumanist technologies? If so, what federal departments and programs, if any, would you cut simultaneously. So candidate Ben Zion, you have three minutes for that question. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I, do, uh, I do have some thoughts on this subject. Um, and I spoke to my friend, uh, Dr. Dan Elton, um, who's been kind enough to endorse the futurist uh, New Deal for America. Uh, Dr. Dan Elton of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, he does have some firsthand knowledge of uh, this, very, uh, this very concern. And uh, so we were able to speak at length on this subject recently. And um, in fact, uh, we've done talks before. He's been uh, uh, kind enough to participate in, in some of these things, including coming on the Futures New Deal uh, podcast. And we're going to do another talk on this subject. Uh, there are many ways uh, that we can be uh, courting or otherwise facilitating uh, uh, this good life extension work, uh, finding researchers in this field um, and, um, and bringing them into this organization. Uh, of course, we need to be shifting the focus of these organizations uh, to better public health outcomes. As I've said many times, I may be sounding like a broken record, um, uh, treating aging as a disease and adjusting our, our uh, initiatives and undertakings accordingly. Um, and um, uh, we, we also have to resist uh, the urge to seize upon every flimsy pretext, uh, particularly for cutting uh, medical research. It's been done in the past, and we don't want to see it happening, particularly uh, when so many lives are at stake 
as we are on the verge of radical life extension. So whether it is in the public or private sector, we must support this good work. And uh, this is truly the best way uh, to hasten a longevity escape velocity at a civilizational level. I will thank the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. We will add 81 seconds to your future speaking slots. Next, we proceed to candidate Chatke. Candidate Chatke, would you increase funding for the NIH? And if so, what federal departments and programs would you cut simultaneously? I think that uh, if we uh, privatize the National Institute of Health, rather than keep it as a government funded entity that the, and provide um, a tax incentive where the corporations are allowed to write off any, uh, any uh, medical R&D expenses, including uh, money donated to the NIH, uh, I think that that would be uh, a much more uh, direct method of uh, making basic research happen better and faster. Uh, government grants are of necessity a, um, an inefficient thing. It is merely a side effect of it being a government grant. You can't avoid that. Um, and as for federal departments and programs, uh, to cut simultaneously, there are a number of them. We can get, uh, while I am in full support of private funding of the arts and uh, humanities, the government, it does not have that mandate. And uh, so um, I believe that we could endow a uh, privatized National Institute of Health with a much better uh, outcome than if we uh, continue under government oversight with politics involved. Thank you, Candidate Chatke. We will add 84 seconds to your future speaking slots. Next, we proceed to Candidate Taylor. Would you support increases in funding for the NIH? And if so, what federal departments and programs would you cut simultaneously? Thank you, uh, Mr. DeVerde, for this question. Uh, this is a major pillar of my new vision. Publicly funded research is the best option and really the only good option because the results of that research need to be made available to all. I worry if the uh, case that Mr. Shakti has uh, put forward, corporations will keep this research un, you know, hidden for themselves. They're in it for profit. While public research becomes a property of, of all um, to be pursued um, by with further research as it's made available to more and more uh, scientists. With the brightest medical and scientific minds focused on developing medicine and technology, we can improve all of our lives. Currently, the NIH invests about $40 billion in the medical research. About 25 times that, almost a trillion dollars, just shy of a trillion dollars, is spent on military and defense spending. For half of my life, we've been at war. It's time we end that war, we bring our troops home, and we redir redirect some of that spending to projects that will benefit all of us including greater investment in the NIH. Thank you, Candidate Taylor. We will add 90 seconds to your future speaking times. And thank you to all candidates for addressing question seven. We proceed to question eight. Once again, from Secretary Pavel Illin, what do you consider to be the best approach to achieve a universal basic income and why is it the best approach? Candidate Ben Zion, you have three minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Um, and uh, a wonderful question from Pavel. Uh, some wonderful discussion of this um, in our podcast, which I mentioned. Please go back and watch it. Uh, this man has a lot of insights into life extension and into techno futurism and many, many wonderful things to say about basic income. So I would say that overwhelmingly the best approach 
uh, for this country is a federal land dividend uh, orig originated by the founder of this party, Zoltan Ispin, and uh, continued in, in uh, as a kind of tribute to him, and also uh, um, because it is a very sound uh, notion, uh, continued in our futurist new, pardon me, futurist New Deal for America. That's the ticket. Um, and uh, in, in this uh, podcast that I mentioned, Pavel Lewin said, uh, uh, in posing this question uh, to all of us, he described a basic income as a game changer. Um, and um, uh, those people uh, who take an austerity uh, view of this are not looking at the, uh, the ways in which this would add uh, many, many trillions of dollars uh, to our economy, and more importantly, a vast human development and, uh, and a real uh, 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 quality of life uh, steps by taking this bold step of uh, supporting a middle class basic income uh, for all citizens age 18 uh, to 63. Um, the collapse of our middle class, it's not just an accident. It is a result of corporatist policies uh, going back some decades uh, that have been insinuated into our two party system by men like Charles Koch. The very kinds of policies that uh, Mr. Shatke uh, would tend to like to see continue. Uh, these are things that have hurt our middle class. And um, had we not had uh, this, uh, this shadow party in the form of the Koch network, I believe our country would look uh, much more like modern Germany. Uh, not a perfect place, but a place that does have a uh, fairer, wage, uh, fairer wages and um, uh, the kinds of infrastructure to uh, support a healthy middle class. Uh, because here in the United States, uh, we have 55% of workers now working in artificially low wage service jobs and paying artificially high housing costs. Uh, and this problem is only going to get worse in the near term, in the face of AI and, and automation. And uh, it's why I've often described the Futurist New Deal for America's federal land dividend as a stopgap. Basic income might be a temporary measure, uh, but it would be a life-saving and game-changing measure. measure. As, uh, as Mr. Illen said. Um, so um, it's what we must. Thank you, Kip. I'll, I'll thank the remainder of my time. Yes, uh, we had a momentary interruption, but I believe we heard the vast majority of your answer. If you'd like to repeat your last sentence, you may do so. Uh, no, no, I believe I believe I was finished. All right, so we will add 20 seconds to your future seeking times. And then we proceed to Candidate Chatke. Candidate Chatke, what do you consider the best approach to achieve a universal basic income? And why is it the best approach? Well, the universal basic income would replace uh, certain other safety nets that we have in, in the uh, uh, in society. It would replace uh, the unemployment insurance, it would replace the, uh, the, the uh, old age insurance program. So uh, the first thing to do would be to use those monies uh, to, for the universal basic income. Uh, unfortunately, those monies are trivial uh, compared to even $1,000 a month per person at UBI. Um, so I think the first step would be to do a negative income tax uh, situation where if you are paying less than, if, if you are making less than 20,000 a year, um, then you're around, you're, you're pushed up to 20,000 a year or something uh, with a negative income tax. And uh, that way, the people who really need it uh, don't have any more fi paperwork to file. They already are filing income tax mostly. Um, the people who are absolutely in poverty, all they have to do is file a 1040EZ. And then there you get uh, at least the people who are at the bottom and need that most uh, can get their, uh, their negative income tax. And then as productivity increases in our uh, GDP rises, um, then we can work on expanding that negative income tax to higher and higher levels. And, um, you know, there's, there's no reason to take in taxes from somebody making a million dollars a year in a business and then send them back $20,000. That, that, that's just silly. 
it's better just not to take the money in the first place. And so I think that's the best way to achieve a universal basic. Thank you, Candidate Chatke. You spoke for two minutes, so we will add 60 seconds to your future speaking times. And now we proceed to Candidate Taylor. Candidate Taylor, what do you consider to be the best approach to achieve a universal basic income, and why is it the best approach? I have to agree with Mr. Ben Zion on many of his points. Uh, as we lose jobs to automation, as people need retraining because they worked in sectors lost or changed due to technological advancements, such as the energy sector or transportation, a universal basic income will provide a safety net to protect the American workforce. Furthermore, UBI allows individuals to pursue uh, paths that were previously closed to them, uh, such as careers in the arts. For those reasons, I propose a UBI of $2,000 per month per adult and $500 per child. UBI isn't meant to replace income from employment permanently, uh, but to augment it and to provide a stepladder for those impacted by the changing economy. And as a supplement uh, for those who are underemployed or, or who are seeking to better themselves through academic, uh, creative, or innovative pursuits. So my opponents claim that uh, UBI is too expensive, but you can visit my website at taylor2020.vision uh, to learn how affordable it really can be. And that doesn't even include the economic growth created by UBI as poor and middle class Americans gain more buying power and will reinvest that uh, in their communities. All of this can be paid for by raising taxes on the richest 10% of Americans and by closing the loopholes that allow massive corporations such as Amazon to pay little or no taxes. We cannot afford to continue in an economic system that only increases the divide between the super rich and the rest of America. Thank you, Candidate Taylor. We will add 70 seconds to your future speaking times. Thank you to all of our candidates for your answers on our universal basic income question. Now we proceed to question nine, where we begin to venture into the realm of foreign policy. Member Thomas James O'Carroll notes that Donald Trump recently announced that he would create a new branch of the military named the Space Force. And Mr. O'Carroll asks, can one nation actively declare sole dominion of space with military force? Or should military deployment in space be an international endeavor? And is it even necessary? Candidate Ben Zion, you have three minutes. Yes. The United States or any other nation uh, should not be asserting the kind of dominion that's described in this question um, in space uh, based on the same legal principle uh, as respecting the neutrality of international waters, uh, notions of this kind. But as we know, the United States um, has often uh, uh, thrown aside these protocols and uh, behaved quite aggressively uh, on the world stage uh, to this day. Uh, there are concerns here. Um, in the Trump administration, I, I would say that on um, in terms of this aggression, but I would say on certain measures, he's not substantively worse uh, in foreign policy aggression than the aggregate of his predecessors, uh, except perhaps in the uh, trade war arena. Um, I, I do feel quite strongly about space initiatives, uh, particularly on this uh, related subject of near Earth development. I did a series of discussions um, and interviews uh, uh, with with a, a Russian gentleman and um, um, I worked with his uh, design team. You can see those articles uh, on the Transhumanist uh, uh, Party website. Um, and uh, we work closely on a prospectus for a partial space elevator uh, designed to use existing materials, science, and technologies um, uh, to uh, create an intermediary step uh, towards a better um, development and industrialization of near Earth. And this would lower the cost of fuel uh, significantly and facilitate um, uh, this uh, moves to our outer atmosphere and the moon. Uh, this near Earth industrialization holds a great deal of promise uh, for many new industries. And uh, this automated design in, uh, in this particular partial um, 
uh, uh, space elevator. It's something that I suggest uh, you look into. Uh, there's a recent piece, I can uh, share the link in the comments, uh, that echoes many of these design ideas just in recent days. Uh, I've seen a, a mainstream media piece that I've also been sharing uh, quite a lot. Um, so we can uh, be uh, moving towards a uh, true space age civilization. And uh, in this context, I spoke with John Carrick's also uh, yesterday in our interview. Some of you have seen that, you might recall. Uh, there's an awful lot that we'd be, we would be doing uh, by, uh, uh, by taking these bold moves uh, to, um, uh, to build out uh, new markets in other areas. Uh, so it's a, it's a good uh, step to be taking a win-win for everyone. We could even see um, um, uh, steps towards other things that we want as techno-futurists resulting from this. I'll bank the remainder of my time. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. We will add 32 seconds to your future speaking time. We proceed to candidate Shaki. What are your thoughts on the Space Force and whether it is even necessary? Well, um, asking can is a matter of technical ability. Asking should is a matter of ethics. Um, can, yes, America can uh, assert dominion over space if they wish. We have the technical ability. We have uh, higher technical ability than anyone else. And um, as uh, anyone with any experience in war fighting would know, um, having the high ground means it's very difficult to um, make a response to the person who has the high ground. You have a lot more, harder time attacking high ground than being defending it. Um, now, whether we should, that's a completely different matter. I think that uh, the existing uh, UN treaties on the non-militarization of space are uh, robust. And I think that uh, the United States is holding to those treaties that they have signed. Um, I don't think um, it is appropriate to uh, militarize space. I don't, I, as president, I would not do it. But um, as to whether it's necessary, I think that we have uh, a world that is the most peaceful that it ever has been. And um, and it is getting better, uh, despite what the news says. Um, and even uh, Russia and China and Pakistan and India, the other nuclear nations, are working out their differences without violence for the most part. So I think that uh, it is not necessary to have um, a large uh, military presence in space, but I do believe that it is ap appropriate for the United States military to have a defensive posture ready to deploy into orbit if necessary to defend the country. And that's the remainder. Thank you, Thank you candidate Chatke. We will add 25 seconds to your future speaking slots. And now we proceed to candidate Taylor. What are your thoughts on the Space Force and whether it is necessary? Uh, space exploration and research are definitely necessary. But I would be wary of any nation establishing military control of space, especially if done without international agreement. I would like to see more investment in space research and more international cooperation. Uh, the resources and knowledge that uh, we'll gain uh, that will become available to us as we increase our reach into the cosmos will be virtually limitless. The United States should be a leader in further developments, but not in a military capacity, uh, except where it's necessary uh, to defend our uh, investments and to protect those of our allies. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add 
129 seconds to your future speaking times. Thank you to all candidates for answering question. Question 10 is also on foreign policy from Mr. Thomas James O'Carroll, who observes that Donald Trump has become the first U.S. president to step across the South North Korean border. Some say he is mending rifts, while others say he is failing at keeping peace in specific regions of the world. What would you do to improve international relations across the board with allies and previously classed adversaries? Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor for three minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, before I begin, uh, if you could take a moment and uh, you don't have to answer now, but tell me uh, whether I have a, a debit or credit with you at this time in terms of uh, remaining uh, moments. Um, but yes, uh, thank you, Gennady, for uh, uh, for that question. And thank you, Mr. Thomas, uh, Thomas O'Carroll, for uh, these numerous thought-provoking questions. Um, uh, the, the, the ways in which this uh, President Trump might be amending rifts, some of these rifts he's himself uh, uh, tended to agitate as much uh, prior to mending. Um, but it does seem to break down um, along oddly uh, partisan uh, lines, uh, trans transnationally. Uh, he does seem to have a kind of a strange soft spot for, for right-wing despots and, uh, <laughs> and having uh, rather unusual dealings with them sometimes. Uh, but still, whatever strange or even comical business uh, is done there. If it is done in the interest of maintaining peace on the world stage, um, especially g given the difficulty of this uh, imperfect uh, uh, power politics relationship that the United States has, we have this military industrial complex uh, guilty of much excess and overreach. And uh, and uh, U.S. imperialism there, it's, uh, it's not an easy matter uh, to try and unpack. And so um, a person who is doing their due diligence to try and maintain a peace on the world stage, I consider that to be something approaching in that positive. Um, um, it, it's a big part of the, the job also to be reading these intelligence briefings, to understanding the mind of people working in state and working in these other departments. And um, also, I, I think it's important um, as we, we as techno futurists can be bringing a lot more to the table. Uh, to stabilize these fundamental uh, relations. And uh, these problems internationally, I do believe, are driven by economic concerns. If you remove economic instability from the equation in these states, as I believe we are doing over these decades since we have entered the networked world and will increasingly be doing, as you remove that economic instability in those states, uh, there is very little impetus uh, for acting as rogue states. And uh, these, these kind of interventions, these kinds of, uh, of, of ways of being in the world, it's something that we as techno-singulitarians or people uh, of this kind uh, who uh, uh, believe in, in uh, strong techno-progress uh, have, have the uh, institutional understanding and insights into building. Uh, so uh, we can be uh, helping achieve a greater peace on the world stage um, as uh, uh, transhumanists. I do believe that. I'll bank the remainder of my time. I'd like to have an assessment of my remaining time, if possible. Yes, thank you. So I will add 32 seconds to your time from this segment. And in total, you now have a positive accumulation of time, 15 seconds saved up. So <laughs> Very nice, thank you. <laughs> it's quite a comeback from uh, some of the previous balances. Uh, but do know that you now have some time savings. Uh, now we proceed to Candidate Chatke. Candidate Chatke, you have three minutes to discuss this question of improving international relations across the board with both allies and previously classed adversaries. It has been stated that either goods cross, cross borders or armies do. Uh, this is um, a truism. Uh, it's, 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 so I would remove all barriers to goods crossing borders. And um, I would clear out uh, all sanctions, clear out all uh, foreign interventions in markets, and let uh, goods 
travel as freely as America can do. I would encourage our business partners and the rest of the world to do the same so that free trade can reign. Um, the number of military bases and the ease of acting militarily that the United States has, has led to uh, short-sighted and um, poorly thought out operations throughout the world. Uh, we are currently having active military operations, I believe in like some, something like 45 countries. It's insane. I would bring the troops home. I would sell foreign bases back to the countries that they are in. And if they wish them to have the material and the training uh, to use that material, I would offer them to them. But I would bring our men home. And if they don't want to buy the material, I would bring the material home. If they wish to maintain a defensive treaty, and if they are attacked, we will have response forces. The Marines will be available, but we will not uh, have massive forces available to uh, use and to empire build. I would likewise dis uh, disband most of our Navy, uh, either selling it to the states or to other countries, go to a two-carrier group nation, national fleet under the Coast Guard, where it is a defensive fleet, and then international relations will fall in place as we no longer have a posture of attack against the entire world. And that, I believe, is the best way to improve international relations. Thank you, Candidate Schatke. We will add 15 seconds to your future speaking times. And now we proceed to Candidate Taylor. What would you do to improve international relations with both allies and, and previously classed adversaries? Well, first, let me uh, address what Donald Trump has been doing. Um, I think it's dangerous to lend credibility to dictators and despotic regimes by meeting them without, uh, without any preconditions. The North Korean government in particular is holding back its own people by preventing them from advancing in technology and in freedom. Two things we transhumanists hold dear. At the same time that he befriends these despots, Donald Trump makes decisions to alienate and push away our allies, such as the impending trade war with Germany. He has failed in international relations, despite his claims to the contrary. And we are no safer today than when he took office. I will strengthen our relationships with our allies in order to work with them for the advancement of all humanity, to solve problems that threaten the whole world, and to bring about peace around the globe. If the answers to life extension and uh, global climate change are not found in the United States, they will most likely come from our allies, from Europe, from Australia, from Japan, from Israel. And we need to strengthen our bonds with these nations in order uh, for the benefit of all nations. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Taylor. We will add 95 seconds to your future speaking slot. Now we thank all of our candidates for answering question 10. And we proceed to question 11 from member Mike DiVerde, who notes that in your first term as president of the United States, you may only have one chance at a single signature issue. What will be your main program that you spend your political capital enacting? And what current federal departments and programs, if any, will you cut to fund your signature program. Candidate Bell, you have the floor for three minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Well, thank you for that question, Mike. Um, it's an important one, and it's the thing that I've alluded to before. 
Um, I think you can probably anticipate uh, my answer, all of you. Uh, the Futurist New Deal for America, uh, the, uh, the number one initiative uh, therein is a middle class basic income for every adult age 18 to 63. And um, this is uh, what we can do. Uh, we, need to, we need to propel, as Andrew Yang, also a basic income candidate, uh, says, the real economy. Uh, we need to uh, allow people, as uh, Matt Taylor said, uh, to be uh, starting the small businesses uh, that they wanted, that they have wanted to start, uh, to be doing other things that are not monetized, but are still very valuable pro-social behaviors, uh, taking care of family and loved ones, um, engaging in all manner of good things in the community. Uh, right now, these things are effectively disincentivized, uh, but we need to uh, create a civilization uh, that does this, and in doing so, will add many trillions of dollars uh, to the marketplace. We will not be uh, losing out uh, by creating uh, this program. And uh, because this program is, is funded uh, through this uh, federal land lease, uh, we will be able to fund, uh, fund it effectively on day one, January 21st, uh, 2021. We will have these contracts in place uh, with these many, many, many uh, corporations and institutions to lease these lands. Uh, these lands are held in great number here in the United States. 85% of them are not national parks. And so we can uh, lease them out uh, to carbon neutral companies and institutions uh, that are in keeping with a specific uh, design aesthetic. They must return them as they receive them. Um, and in doing so, we can uh, generate $173 trillion over 10 years. And that is enough to uh, fund uh, this initiative and uh, fill in some gaps in, in, other, in other initiatives as well. And um, uh, we, can, we can do this and we will see great benefits uh, to having done so. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there is no doubt there. Um, I'll take a moment and talk about the other pillars of the Futurist New Deal for America, uh, e-governance, uh, specifically in i-voting, a blockchain secured voting uh, allowed for in every state. Everyone has that option. And of course, uh, using those additional trillions, uh, we will improve our public health service and we will build a public health service uh, that is a longevity public health service that will be costing less, that will be drawing less from the public coffers and doing more. And we will do that by shifting, as I have said, away from this end of life care, away from this triage, to prevention and oversight of citizens using digitalization and personalized medicine. Uh, this is These are the things that we can do in a Ben Zion presidency, and it is what we will do um, in this position. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Zion. I will add one second to your future speaking times. And now we proceed to candidate Shatke. Candidate Shatke, if you only have a chance at one signature issue, what would it be? And what current federal departments and programs will you cut to fund your signature issue? I will not use the qualifier, if any, uh, because I know that you will cut some of them, but you have three minutes. I, I think the uh, signature issue would be privatizing the FDA. Um, that would be the single most uh, effective means of furthering transhumanism and life extension for uh, the United States. Um, as for uh, departments to cut, uh, if I had the ability, I would cut them all. <laughs> Um, except the Coast Guard um, and other things that are specifically listed in the Constitution. As uh, president, that would be my um, my vow. I would have vowed to uh, and taken an oath to abide by the Constitution. So uh, it would be my province to decide whether uh, any particular program was uh, constitutional or not, and to uh, implement it or not. And uh, that's all I have to say on that. Thank you, candidate Shatke. We will add 116 seconds to your future speaking times. And now we move on to candidate Taylor. What would be your signature issue if you had to pick one? And what current federal departments and programs, if any, would you cut to fund it? While I uh, dream about and plan to pursue my vision for health care reform and for universal basic income, and we desperately need to tackle the threat of 
climate change. I realize that these are dreams that might not come to fruition right away because of the gridlock in Washington. Therefore, I would first direct my administration to develop a plan to invest in technological infrastructure. I have seen firsthand the difficulties that students who do not have internet access at home uh, struggle with. They never catch up with their peers who do. Rural communities suffer because the infrastructure, the coverage just isn't there. Cell phone companies boast uh, about covering over 90% of Americans. For most of those companies, I'm in that 10% uh, in the dead zone. And those that do provide coverage have regional monopolies because they are the only companies in the area. This further divides America as the urban centers have greater access to education, uh, to communication, and to business. There just isn't the economic incentive to uh, expand coverage in rural and poorer areas. But in the 21st century, Internet access is becoming a necessity and a basic human right. I would find ways to incentivize companies to uh, invest in expansion into uncovered areas and where necessary, develop public infrastructure uh, to bring access to all American communities, all of which can be paid for by the reduction of military spending and the increase in corporate taxes. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add 75 seconds to your future speaking times. And that concludes the responses to question 11. We proceed now to question 12 from Thomas James O'Carroll, who is curious regarding how would you approach the US federal and allocate funds among the various functions of government? Would you advocate growing or reducing federal spending overall. Candidate Ben Zion, you have three minutes. Yes, uh, excellent question. Another great question from uh, uh, Thomas O'Carroll. Um, uh, there, there are many concerns uh, with the US uh, federal budget and, um, and all, of, all of these matters. Um, uh, as I have mentioned, the Futurist New Deal um, it, it, is a, it does describe in this basic income a kind of growth, but it is a kind of growth that is, um, that is funded through novel means and uh, so that it does not uh, run the risk of, of hyperinflation. We've heard some concerns from people in the pre-show and, um, and uh, on, in all of these forums about uh, concerns of this kind to stabilizing our economy. Uh, but we know that there was quantitative easing to the tune of many trillions of dollars um, in, um, in the wake of the 2009 uh, financial crisis uh, that did not just significantly destabilize markets in the way that uh, uh, people of this kind would have predicted. It's a different kind of beast that we have, this fintech-run economy. And um, uh, there, is, there is always going to be some uh, flexibility there. And, uh, but these concerns, they, they might arise to, to a high degree um, in the, um, in, to a higher degree in the, in the basic incomes described uh, by um, uh, candidate Haywire, uh, but uh, because the federal land dividend is is uh, funded through this uh, novel uh, novel revenue stream that we described, uh, we don't have to worry about this quite so much um, in this context. Uh, there's um, there's uh, so many other kinds of things that we could talking be talking about in terms of programs uh, that we want to build um, in the in the world of e governance. Uh, these programs will also tend uh, to be paying for themselves in short order. Uh, uh, I, an i-voting system, um, we already have the digital infrastructure and, uh, and the devices for, for almost everyone to be doing this. Um, uh, many other e-services, it is much cheaper uh, to provide these uh, services as e-services rather than uh, through bricks and mortar, bricks and mortar uh, outlets. Um, at the municipal and and state level, um, uh, so uh, these are these are good problems to be having with uh, in term for techno futurists. Uh, again, all of these things in the constellation of digitalization, uh, we can be talking about things that will, in short order, be costing pennies on the dollar, and that is uh, al will allow us to be doing more with less. Uh, the basic a uh, basic concept also for for futurists. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, in the concept of ephemeralization popularized by Buckminster Fuller uh, to be able to do more and more with less and less until ultimately you are able to do everything with nothing. And I do believe that we are well on track uh, to be doing that. And uh, people who would tend to uh, uh, describe worst case scenarios, the sky is falling. I think that they are being a little bit deceptive. Uh, they may not be techno singularitarians um, in, the, in the fullest sense of the word, uh, but thank you. You're an idiot. Anyway, um, thank you, Kate. Thank you for your remarks. And you were right on time. We will proceed to candidate Shatke. How would you approach the US federal budget, allocate funds among the various functions of government, and would you advocate growing or reducing federal spending overall? Well, the uh, U.S. Transhumanist Party platform uh, calls for the abolition of the income tax. Uh, that is $1.6 trillion in federal funds that would not be collected. Um, that is uh, troublesome. <laughs> uh, that means that we have to uh, immediately cut the federal government to uh, about one fifth its size in order just to be working on a even keel with no additional uh, programs. Um, so that is a radical slash and burn idea. If we add in a UA, UBI and we don't have some additional funding, um, then we are in serious financial trouble. Um, now, I agree that if the, there are government assets, that those should be immediately uh, used to the fullest extent. Um, but I think the existing Bureau of Land Management uh, leasing programs uh, are showing very little in uh, income. And uh, so I don't see how uh, adding additional land to that program would add anything to the budget that would make up that huge shortfall. So the federal government things that must be done according to the Constitution are the Coast Guard, the Patent Office, the U.S. Postal Service, very little else. Um, the ability to raise an army, I think, should be kept. I, I believe that the uh, Army, Navy, and Marines should all be brought down to a cadre level, bringing through a significant number of tr troops every two years for training, uh, but then immediately discharging them back into the Civilian Population Act as part of the militia. And I believe that by doing this, we can significantly downsize the government to the point where we can abolish the income tax and still have a government that functions and not destroy the country with uh, massive inflation, uh, government uh, money printing like they're doing in Venezuela. So I believe that that's about the only thing that we can do in order to maintain the uh, US Transhumanist Party platform. Thank you, Candidate Chatke. We will add seven seconds to your future speaking times. And now we proceed to candidate Taylor. How would you approach the US federal budget and allocate funds among the various functions of government? And would you advocate growing or reducing federal spending overall? The, um, the growing federal deficit um, is a real issue um, and uh, I think uh, that needs further consideration on on how to uh, to bring that amount down. Um, I'm of the belief that we should reduce uh, the deficit. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean reducing spending, um, but we need to find new ways of uh, increasing the governmental income. I must admit that I need to look further into Mr. Ben Zion's uh, federal land dividend plan. Um, and and learn more about that. Uh, perhaps that is a direction to uh, to head. Um, 
But as I've explained already, my budget would include a universal basic income for all Americans, uh, expansion of Medicare to include a public option, and increased investment in the NIH. I'd also like to invest in technological infrastructure, as I just discussed, and increase our investment in education. Um, these are major costs, but we can pay for them uh, by reducing military spending. Um, also by increasing taxes on the top 10% of income earners in America and by closing the corporate tax loopholes. Uh, overall, by taxing the super rich and massive corporations, we can achieve our lofty goals while still reducing that budget deficit. Uh, as we move into the future, I think that we should be investing more into extending human life than ending it. Uh, that we should be putting more into bioengineering than into bullets and more into promoting education than into propping up giant corporations. Thank you, candidate Taylor. We will add 62 seconds to your future speaking times. And before we proceed to question 13, I will note that we are now at the stage where there will be no further positive time accumulation because for question 13, each candidate will have an additional two minutes, but consider essentially budgeting your time because you will need to allocate that time between that question and then your subsequent open remarks or closing remarks, however uh, you would wish to construe those. So I will give you an understanding of where you stand in terms of time, including the 120 seconds that would be added for question 13. Candidate Benzion, you would have 136 seconds. Candidate Shatke, you would have 718 seconds. And candidate Taylor, you would have 1006 seconds. So. Uh, be mindful of that time. And as I've stated, we will go through the rotation until each candidate either exhausts his time or essentially yields the remainder of his time. So question 13 comes from Denora Delphine, our Director of Admissions and Public Relations, who asks, what are the transhumanist movements and the U.S. Transhumanist Party's greatest challenges preventing growth. So focus your answers on both the transhumanist movement generally and the U.S. Transhumanist Party in particular. Candidate Ben Zion, you have the floor. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, this is an interesting question and uh, not an easy one to an answer. Uh, as I've mentioned um, in, in other discussions, uh, uh, one of my campaign promises is that I will grow uh, this organization to 10,000 members by 2022 and um, uh, be growing this organization and building this organization in other ways besides. And um, um, there's, there's some impediments to this. Uh, but it's a good work uh, that we can do in raising awareness for life extension and other positive uh, techno-optimist outcomes. And um, um, uh, some people uh, look at the diversity of political opinions in this organization, and they might uh, describe it as something that is uh, preventing growth. I don't feel that way. I think uh, that we have to have this uh, this kind of robust uh, discussion that we're seeing on this panel, and I, and I welcome it. Uh, we uh, should be open to accommodating all political philosophies. And um, as I mentioned already, the Futurist New Deal uh, was uh, devised as a sort of concession uh, to this reality. And um, I think that um, as, as a candidate for president for the United States uh, Transhumanist Party, I will be able to continue to be doing outreach to uh, diverse organizations and uh, professional individuals through the podcast and other media and um, um, uh, overcoming these hurdles uh, to growth. Uh, we've been able to do an awful lot in this uh, short time uh, with uh, raising awareness for these oh so important issues 
uh, particularly uh, a life extension. And um, I do feel that that is uh, the good work that we can be doing in this community. Uh, the Futurist New Deal for America, it is uh, the best way forward for this organization. Uh, uh, be aware, the radical life extension is closer than you think. Uh, so plan accordingly. I'll bank the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. So you spoke for 116 seconds, which will leave you 20 seconds for concluding remarks when it is time. And now we proceed to candidate Shaki. What are your thoughts on the transhumanist movements and the US transhumanist party's greatest challenges that are preventing growth? The transhumanist movement is uh, unknown. It's a fringe group that's uh, basically been very cliquish in its uh, activities and barely uh, making us a, 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 a blip on the world stage. So I think the first thing is um, a general uh, advertising campaign uh, to let the people of the world know that transhumanism is a thing and is an actual uh, sane concept that's not just something bandied about uh, by rich people taking uh, stem cell treatments in, uh, you know, Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> um, so I think that that uh, basic un uh, un uh, level of uh, I healed my time. <laughs> All right. Uh, candidate Shatke, uh, you spoke for 84 seconds. And now we proceed to candidate Taylor. What are your thoughts on this question of the transhumanist movements and the U.S. transhumanist party's greatest challenges preventing growth? Well, um, recent controversies on the use of the, trans, uh, the term transhumanism aside, uh, the Transhumanist Party faces an uphill battle against public ignorance and, and even fear. Um, fear of technology, fear of the future, and fear of the unknown. If we choose candidates that won't be taken seriously by the American public, or if we continue to only focus on posing lofty philosophical thought problems rather than solving real-world problems, uh, we won't break through into the greater collective consciousness in a positive way. Transhumanism needs strong, positive branding uh, and a collection of ambassadors um, to spread the message about how the ideals of the movement represent a bright future for the entire world. Uh, and I encourage the members of the U.S. Transhumanist Party to, um, to think about how they can be those ambassadors uh, to the greater community. I think this is our chance for the uh, Transhumanist Party to break out into the public eye and into traditional and new media outlets. Um, I think this, this, is, um, this is the dawning of a new era for transhumanism. And I encourage the membership of the U.S. Transhumanist Party to carefully consider and carefully choose the face of uh, the USTP uh, to best promote the image of transhumanism. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Taylor. You spoke for 103 seconds. So now we proceed to the open forum stage of the debate. First, we have candidate Ben Zion, who has 20 seconds remaining. So these would be your concluding remarks, but what can you tell our viewers in 20 seconds? Yes, I, I could tell you simply this. Uh, vote for me, uh, Ben Zion 2020, uh, in the upcoming primary 
and uh, support the Futurist New Deal for America, uh, the most well thought out of these platforms. We're doing the good work uh, that these other candidates uh, haven't had the time to do, perhaps. And we have a by, by far the best platform uh, that uh, please vote for Ben Zion 2020 in this primary. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Ben Zion. Uh, we appreciate your participation in this debate, and we certainly encourage all of our viewers to look into the Futurist New Deal podcast. You have done some tremendous work with your interviews with various transhumanist and non-transhumanist, but nonetheless important thinkers. So most definitely, we greatly appreciate your running in this race and all of your insights in the debate today. Now, we still have candidates Shackey and Taylor with significant amounts of time accumulated. Candidate Shackey, you have 634 seconds. And candidate Taylor, you have 903 seconds. So we can essentially rotate between the two of you and you can offer any remarks you wish on ideas that were covered in this debate thus far, or your, your policy suggestions that you feel have not uh, sufficiently been covered yet. You may respond to what other candidates have stated. You may respond to one another, but we will essentially proceed uh, between the two of you. Uh, each of you will still have the floor completely while you're speaking, uh, but it is up to you what you will make of this opportunity. So candidate Shecky, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, fellow members of the Transhumanist Party, I, uh, I must admit that I did not know about your party until uh, June. And uh, since then, I've tried to be active in uh, getting to know the party and the people in it and getting to uh, understand your goals. And I wholeheartedly embraced the party as uh, completely in line with my longstanding beliefs uh, as a futurist, as a science fiction author, as a science fiction fan. And um, I have focused my life on doing what I can in order to improve the situation for the world and in order to bring about the future that I think humanity can reach. And I think that the United States is the hotbed of innovation. And I think freedom is the way to make that innovation happen. And um, I think anyone telling you, uh, oh yes, we can do this, we can give you this and this and this and this, uh, who doesn't have a grasp of the scale of the problem uh, from the get-go is a snake oil salesman and you shouldn't trust them any further than you can throw them. And with that, I will let uh, Mr. Taylor have some remarks. Thank you, candidate Shacky. You spoke for 113 seconds, and now we proceed to candidate Taylor. You have the floor. The, um, the benefits of not being as long-winded as Mr. Ben Zion. Um, that we have all this uh, time to speak and, and push forward our, our, our ideas and agenda. Um, America stands on the precipice of a new age, and we can either embrace the change and soar into a brighter future, uh, or we can continue on the path we are on towards despair. Our similarities within transhumanism and our similarities uh, to the greater public um, should unite us more than our differ differences divide us. And we can find common ground in the pursuit of the advancement and improvement of human life uh, through technology, science, and medicine. My new vision will show the way towards the future we need, and we can achieve it by bringing our ideas to a greater audience. 
this is our opportunity to do just that. I encourage uh, our audience here to read all about my platform at taylor2020.vision uh, or on my Facebook page at fb.me slash taylor for America. And I'd like to encourage anyone watching who isn't yet a member of the uh, USTP, but who liked what they heard tonight uh, from any of the candidates uh, to join the USTP at transhumanist-party.org slash membership uh, by Saturday so that they can vote um, on the uh, in the party primary. Um, Furthermore, I'd like to thank Gennady uh, again for moderating this debate. First, uh, I'd like to thank Steele for providing the U.S. Transhumanist Party with uh, this great platform to spread the good word. And I'd like to thank my fellow candidates for a well-reasoned and civil debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. You spoke for 124 seconds, and I greatly appreciate your good words and your remarks concerning membership registration. Once again, that link is transhumanist-party membership. So anyone watching this who isn't a member yet, please go to the U.S. Transhumanist Party website and register for free membership. So now we come again to candidate Shackey. You still have 521 seconds if you choose to use them. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. I think uh, we uh, we have seen a uh, political ploy by Ben Zion in this uh, debate, in which he didn't actually answer the first couple of questions, but just used it to put forth his pro platform, uh, Futurist New Deal, uh, snake oil again and again. Um, <laughs> and so that's, you know, he, he got his uh, licks in early, figuring that people wouldn't watch the entire stream. He's uh, counting on stupidity. I am not going to insult people who are futurists by using, uh, misusing the time and not answering questions. Um, I think that people who are in the transhumanist party have come here because they thought about the future. I think we have differences in how we approach it. I think a lot of people have um, been taken in by oh, uh, luxury techno-communism. <laughs> uh, and, um, and that's a dangerous place to be. There's a lot of uh, especially youth who have been sold snake oil their entire lives because they have never dealt with anybody in the private sector except the companies who are charging them for the things they want. And they don't understand where wealth comes from and where uh, things actually happen. Government has no money. Government only has things it has taken from its people. It does not make a pie bigger to take it, take half the piece from one person and give it to another or, get, or give sl slivers of it to two other people and keep a sliver of it yourself. That does not make a nation wealthier. What makes a nation wealthier is baking another pie and giving that to the other people and letting those people have pieces of pie that nobody else had before that. That is why America grew by leaps and bounds in the 19th century. We kept expanding our pie. We expanded in the 19th century from 13 colonies across the entirety of a continent. I believe America can expand from one continent across the entirety of a solar system. And I believe that only the futurist party of the transhumanist party 
can manage that and can lead America and the world to that. So I think that's all I need to say right now. Uh, thank you, Candidate Chatke. You spoke for 213 seconds. To Candidate Taylor, who still has 779 seconds remaining. Candidate Taylor, you may begin. I, I really thought, uh, since talking is um, my living in a lot of ways, um, that uh, I'd be I'd be the one running out of time. Um, but um, I just wanted to make a little remark. Uh, Mr. Shakti says that um, taking away some of the pie from one and uh, one person and giving it to another does not make the pie bigger. Uh, that's true, um, but we have a system right now in which a few individuals have taken all the pie and um, it's important that we let that pie be uh, spread out among uh, the whole party, um, the whole group that has gathered. Yes, government is evil. I think, um, I think when we take a look at um, the hoarding of wealth um, among uh, the super the rich, um, among uh, corporations that uh, pay essentially no taxes, um, we find that we can indeed um, spread that around. And I think it's important as we move into a, a futurist economy, uh, one that is driven by automation and driven by um, advances that actually take away the jobs of uh, many Americans, um, myself included. I think, um, I think education is going the way of being a, um, a service provided mostly online. And while I don't think that's necessarily the direction it should take, I think that's the direction it is taking. And perhaps um, soon enough will be taken by AI. Uh, even uh, computer programming thought to be one of the um, bastions of computers will never be able to program themselves um, is becoming more and more automated. So um, as these jobs get taken away, if we don't have a way of um, distributing that wealth, um, then people are going to be in dire straits. And really, uh, as we advance in technology and um, people need to work less and less, we should be getting more and more freedom and more and more liberty and more and more leisure time um, and time to pursue uh, creative endeavors or innovation. Um, the, the parts that are part and parcel to uh, human nature. Um, right now, it's um, AI is very good at certain things while uh, humans are good at creativity and good at innovating and good at uh, thinking outside the box. And, um, and the more we can open up opportunities for people to do just that, uh, the better. And I think that uh, the universal basic income, for instance, uh, will do just that. Um, and I would uh, inform Mr. Shakti that uh, if um, if the Constitution and the, in its rawest form is so important to him, that perhaps he should look into the Constitution party. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. You spoke for 225 seconds. So now we return again to candidate Chatke, who has 308 seconds remaining if he wishes to use them. Candidate Chatke, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I think at this point, the thing that needs to be said is uh, we are transhumanists. We believe that humanity can rise above the limits of flesh and blood, that we can expand the uh, 
realm of mind past just humans born of woman into humans born of silicon into humans born of ape or dolphin or elephant or whatever other animal that can be brought to full sentience. I think that we can uh, expand the place of intelligence in the universe beyond the limits that we have today and that we can bring humanity and and in sapience to the universe not only to our solar system but the technology exists today to make an interstellar voyage and it's not going to cut happen overnight it won't be an 80 year trip it won't it will be a hundreds of years trip if we did it with today's technology but i think that we, it's time humanity left the cradle that humanity left the nursery and that we accept that humanity is not limited to man born of women and those ideals of treating all sentience properly of bringing as much thought into the universe as possible and letting it express itself as freely as possible as long as it doesn't interfere with other sentience i believe that those are the ideals that this party is striving for and i think everybody in this party is trying hard to to fulfill those ideals i do not think Ben Zion is an evil man bent on world domination. I don't think anyone in this party is. I don't think anyone in the transhumanist movement is. Uh, and so whenever uh, the party selects a, uh, a presidential candidate, I will work with what I have available to make that presidential candidate successful. And I hope that all the other presidential candidates and all of the other members of the party agree with that sentiment, that this is the place where people are expanding the very definition of people and making those people as effective for as long as possible as they can be and i thank you for taking the time to listen to my thoughts on the matter and i bid you all peace and joy as you go about your days thank you candidate shecky you spoke for four minutes and four seconds so that then means that if you do choose to speak further, you will have 64 seconds to do so. But in the meantime, we proceed to candidate Taylor. Candidate Taylor, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Mr. Shackey said something uh, very important there and uh, and it may be um, the point on which we agree the most, which is that we um, as humans can uh, rise above our base natures. And uh, and that's what transhumanism is about at its core. And uh, so I appreciate this forum. Um, I appreciate my chance to uh, spread my view, my vision for transhumanism and for the nation. Um, and thank you all once again. Thank you, candidate Taylor. You spoke for 38 seconds. 
And now I will ask Candidate Checky, do you wish to utilize any of your remaining 64 seconds? I think we're pretty much done here. I think we've uh, covered the ground and uh, it's time to put this to bed. Peace and joy and get some sleep. <laughs> well, so thank you. And I saw agreement from Candidate Taylor. We will conclude tonight's debate. Thank you to candidates Ben Zion, Shatke, and Taylor for your spirited participation. We discussed many areas of policy. We were able to discuss areas of disagreement civilly. We were able to focus also on what unites us as transhumanists. I am pleased to have all three of you in this race. Despite the technical difficulties, we made this a good debate. We made this a debate that our audience enjoyed. We had as many viewers on the second live stream as on the first. For those of you who are curious as to what happened to interfere with the first live stream, it seems that some technician tripped over a cable that connected to Steel Archer's router. Uh, it was essentially, I believe, a cleanup person who did this. So quite an unexpected incident, but a non-repeatable incident, thankfully. And we appreciate everyone for bearing with us. Please keep in mind, you have and until- People want to inter internet connect to all of their medical devices. Sadly, <laughs> we still have quite a way to go to ensure the robustness of our technological infrastructure in order to implement many of the transhumanist projects. So anyone who has ideas about how to improve that, uh, we are definitely quite eager to hear them. Uh, but for those of you who haven't registered yet for free membership in the U.S. Transhumanist Party, I once again remind you, register by September 21st to be eligible to vote in our electronic ranked preference primary. If you liked what you heard today from any of the candidates, you don't have to vote for just one. You can rank order the candidates. You can rank order all of the candidates. So if you like something from multiple candidates, you would be able to display that reference as well. So uh, thank you very much, all viewers. Thank you to all of our candidates. Thank you to Steel Archer for your excellent work behind the scenes in co-hosting this debate. Thank you to Levin Jules once again for your pre-debate commentary. We hope you stick around for the post-debate show as well, and I bid you all good night.